All right. Last time we stopped off uh, talking about this idea of visual imagery um, having a relationship with uh, our ability to think spatially. Essentially the idea that perceptually things are organized as we see them, so they're organized spatially in relation to each other. But uh, the theory was proposed basically that we organize the same informa information uh, spatially when we imagine something. So it doesn't necessarily require that organization by the stimulus. Now, a researcher um, named Pilishin decided to look at this question and ask whether or not imagery is spatial or propositional. The idea was that um, spatial representation is an epiphenomenon, meaning that um, it occurs at the same time as this phenomena of uh, perception and spatial uh, organization, um, but it's not a part of that. Our ability to imagine things is not reliant on um, just entirely our spatial ability. Um, and what uh, Pilishin proposed was that uh, imagery is propositional, and that basically when um, we think, we think more in abstract symbols and uh, give meaning uh, to those symbols. Uh, and so he started this imagery debate and uh, basically espoused that we use uh, propositional representation, which is in the form of symbols or language, um, and we have depictive representation, which is similar to realistic pictures. So uh, that's kind of the classical spatial imagery approach, and then we have symbols and language as uh, forms of mental imagery. The idea that we can represent the same information in these two different ways, so in a propositional way, the sentence, the cat is under the table, um, is, a, um, is, a, is knowledge, is information depicted in a symbolic way, um, and, and a picture or an image in our heads of a cat underneath a table um, is a spatial or depictive representation of the same information. Um, and basically, Pilshin was saying that the fact that we can do this and accomplish the same task means that uh, imagery is a bit more complicated than this, this, this spatial organization of information. Um, Pilshin also said that Costlin's results um, can be explained basically that we use real world knowledge unconsciously. Basically, this idea that we don't need to know. Uh, be able to calculate the distance between two things in order to determine that they're far or close to each other. Um, basically, this information is contained within that experience. Um, and that's, that's a really ambiguous way to put that, but I can't really put it any other way. The idea is that we're not just these calculating machines uh, that are calculating pixels spatially in the, to determine the relationship between two objects. Um, the information as to the relationship between those two objects is contained within that sensory information. I don't know if I'm being clear enough, but uh, I don't want to get too far off track. We're going to stick with the basic stuff. Um, and thinking in Pinker, uh, Pinker being a uh, more uh, a more famous uh, ling linguist, um, wanted to look at uh, this idea of um, how we can represent information symbolically. Um, or propositionally as opposed to spatially. And basically, uh, people were instructed uh, to judge whether an arrow that's shown on one slide uh, was pointing at a dot that was shown on a previous slide when the dots aren't there anymore. Um, essentially, a longer reaction time would be indicative of greater distance between the arrow and the dot. The idea that we see the arrow and then have to uh, consider where the dot was when we just saw it, we have to imagine that information. Um, and participants weren't instructed to use visual imagery. Um, and it was happening so rapidly that um, Finke and Pinker were, were trying to determine whether or not this was an unconscious uh, use of information contained within that experience. Um, and what they found basically uh, was that um, the, that, that held up, that hypothesis held up as far as the time, the reaction time um, with which it took people to determine uh, whether or not an arrow was pointing at a dot increased in relationship to the distance between the arrow and the imagined dot. We can also think about comparing imagery and perception in terms of how we actually uh, represent 
distance from objects. The idea that when we have a mental image of something, there is typically an implied distance. I might imagine uh, being far above something or looking very closely at something. And uh, the interesting relationship between imagery and perception in this regard is that when we do imagine things much more closely, um, we're able to figure out finer details about those objects. And this was accomplished using what's called a mental walk task. And essentially, participants were asked to imagine um, animals in relation to each other. So the idea that you imagine an elephant and a rabbit, um, or a rabbit and a fly. And then participants were asked to answer questions um, about uh, the rabbit, basically to describe parts of it. And what um, Coslin pulled from that was the idea that participants who who imagined the elephant and the rabbit had longer reaction times in answering questions about the rabbit, essentially meaning that they were having to extract a bit more detail um, and basically adjust what they had imagined in order to answer questions about that object that was not filling um, their visual field um, or visual imagery field, as it were. And basically, they weren't getting as fine a detail as those participants that were imagining the rabbit and the fly. Um, we can also trick our uh, minds as far as uh, basically convincing people that um, they're imagining something when in reality there is actually a very low level stimulus being presented. And this was shown by Perky, um, basically um, participants being asked to stare at what they thought was a blank wall, but in reality a very faded picture of a banana was being shown. Um, and participants higher than average um, said that they were um, they would imagine uh, fruit that was projected on the wall. Um, and we can demonstrate or we can show uh, the activation in the brain and the similarity between perception and visual imagery by looking at uh, single cell firing rates um, when looking at different stimuli. The idea that we have this overlap in brain activation reinforces the idea that Imagery and perception use very similar mechanisms in order to accomplish what they need to accomplish. Uh, the idea that we can look at a, um, a, an object like a baseball um, and see slightly similar uh, firing rates for um, the same neurons uh, when we're shown a picture versus when we're asked to imagine a picture. Um, and it also demonstrates that for more complex um, stimuli like faces imagining things that are very rich, um, oftentimes we can't capture all of that information using uh, single cell firings. Essentially, because the object is more uh, com complex, we're having to co-opt more neurons, essentially not being able to capture all of that information in single firing. Um, it's also faces, it's also noted that there's a lot more that occurs in the prefrontal cortex, not just in the visual cortex, um, when thinking about things like faces. And Lee Behan um, actually looked at, um, so tried to simplify this in terms of looking at the visual cortex, and um, we're basically able to establish that in being shown a stimulus, a visual stimulus, um, the brain activation that occurs between the time of the stimulus being off and being asked to imagine that stimulus is very similar. Essentially, each peak that you see on uh, this graph is uh, activated neurons, and they're the same neurons that are being activated when we actually see objects. So we're essentially um, reactivating those neurons in an effort to visually imagine things. Now, uh, Ganes wanted to look at this idea of uh, specific areas of the brain and how they might work um, in terms of other sorts of modalities. So not just visual information, but perhaps um, auditory information and how the overlap of this activation um, plays out when you uh, when you don't just show someone a stimulus but you actually ask them to compare stimulus and the procedure that was used um, to study this uh, sort of comparison that might occur um, between being shown a very low level stimulus and having to imagine something entirely um, was shown using this imagery perception uh, split in groups basically um, Participants were shown a tree, allowed to study it, um, and then in the pure imagery uh, condition, participants heard the name of the tree and asked to close their eyes and imagine it, um, whereas those in the perception condition uh, were shown a very fa faint outline of the tree and basically were asked to respond with what 
a W or a T, uh, W meaning that the object that they had studied previously was wider than it was tall. Um, and basically this played out in terms of that reaction time, the speed at which um, we're able to recall that information was very similar. And we also see this overlap in brain activation, um, basically in the deactivation of non-visual areas of the brain. The idea that hearing and touch um, correspond in terms of actual perception versus kind of this mental imagery component. Um, but it's really, in, it's really important to consider that even though there's overlap in these brain activations, mental images are much more fragile, essentially meaning that these networks of neurons that are activating don't activate as rapidly or as strongly when we imagine something or for as long when we're perceiving it. Of course, because the information is in the world, we're not having to keep it um, just in our brain. Um, so we can measure brain response to imagery, but, and while that may indicate something is happening, um, this isn't necessarily causing imagery. This might be a purely perceptual experience. Um, imagine the idea that you can experience something um, but you don't have a very solid image of it in your head because perhaps you were focused on doing something specific um, or in regard to how we look at sensory memory, the idea that this transient sort of perception occurs, um, but we don't have a very salient experience of it and therefore can't bring a piece of visual imagery to mind. We can also look at this uh, interesting deactivation um, in the brain that occurs uh, by using something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. The idea that we can put a strong magnet near the brain um, will essentially kind of scramble areas of the brain, deactivating them temporarily. Um, and I posted a video, um, a link is in the description, um, kind of just showing a demonstration of an individual counting and having this uh, magnet applied to their head. It's really interesting as far as just studying um, how these different activations in the brain, we can inhibit them uh, in a very uh, low impact method, basically studying what areas of the brain are responsible for different sorts of imagery. Now, Koslin et al. Um, decided to use transcranial um, magnetic stimulation um, to inhibit the visual areas of that we use in our brain uh, for a perception and imagery task. And essentially, what they found is that individuals slowed down. They, across the board for in the perception and imagery uh, conditions, uh, they were less able to descri describe these images that they were either imagining or perceiving. Um, and what this is indicative of is that those similar mechanisms are being used regardless of a perceived stimulus or a stimulus that's being imagined. Now we can also uh, demonstrate this in looking at people who suffered trauma and or people who had to undergo surgery. And the idea that we have this um, perceptual mechanism that's functioning all the time and allows us to determine our distance from things, we have a similar mechanism that lets us establish basically our visual field as I was talking about before. And um, what uh, we found in some patients is essentially after having an area of their visual cortex uh, removed during surgery, uh, their ability basically to uh, look at fine details when imagining objects was diminished. Essentially, um, they had lost some capacity to be able uh, to imagine those fine details. Essentially, their distance from objects that they imagine um, had expanded due to uh, this removal of that area of the visual cortex. Um, this is also, interestingly enough, uh, in neuropsychological case studies, um, you can see this thing called unilateral neglect, essentially where um, individuals will still perceive things in their visual field, but will completely ignore those objects. And this, I don't mean like visual field in terms of like outside of your eyes. I mean, in terms of a kind of 50-50 split a person who has unilateral agnosia might not be able to recognize your face if you're on this side of their body, but if you're on this side, they immediately recognize you, showing, um, indicating that there's also this, um, there's also this component to how our brain recognizes information uh, that is based on different lobes of our brain. 
Um, we can also see within a lot of different case studies, uh, basically, that damage to the occipital and parietal lobes impacts our ability to imagine things as well as perceive things. Um, and looking at these individuals, um, we see this evidence for double dissociation um, that basically individuals can perceive things, but they can't imagine them, and vice versa. Um, and one particularly important uh, uh, study done by this was Behrman and uh, co workers, essentially, where uh, these mechanisms were shown to partially overlap uh, because of these individuals, RM and CK, the idea that um, this individual RM could draw accurate pictures of objects, but could not draw accurate pictures of objects from memory indicates that there's some sort of imaging component that has been lost. Um, whereas uh, an individual like CK suffering from a different sort of trauma uh, loses that ability to name pictures of objects, suffers from some sort of agnosia, but is able to draw objects in great detail from memory, um, essentially being a, unable to perceive instantaneously, but to store information and then recall it in the form of visual images. Um, and one problem with this is the idea that um, this processing model that these individuals might be using, um, it, it still overlaps. So you don't get entire loss of perception and ability to imagine information. And what um, what Behrman wanted to say with this was basically the idea that imagery is a top-down process and that this damage in the high visual centers um, was indicative of this, the idea that we use top-down processing um, to explain ideas and expectations. Um, the idea that we're constructing something is reliant on that, that, core, that visual cortex. Um, whereas in terms of perception, this bottom-up information where we take sensory information um, primarily reliant on that occipital lobe and um, basically construct meaning from that. And that's, that's kind of in a nutshell how we can really distinguish perception and imagery, the idea that perception is a bottom-up, um, put simply, is a bottom-up process uh, and imagery is a top-down process. Um, we can also look at this in more of a flowchart sort of way, the idea that in a perceptual process, image the image of an object actually enters the eye via photons, um, and then that goes through more bottom-up processing in terms of the visual receiving area, and then moving to the high visual areas, whereas in terms of generating imagery, um, we only impede that flow if we move from memory storage down. Uh, we don't actually generate images when we uh, imagine things, but the idea is that we're starting from memory and then moving through the higher visual areas to the activation of those visual receiving areas, which typically activate very quickly and then die down. Um, and this also explains basically why a lot of our images are different based on experience. They're heavily reliant on memory. The idea that if you are primed to uh, see this image as a duck, it's difficult uh, to switch to seeing it as a rabbit and vice versa. Depending on what you might have just been primed with, um, your experience as a human being will greatly impact that top-down processing model that imagery is relying on. Now, some ways to use imagery to improve memory, um, and so these are really simple perspectives. Basically, uh, two major uh, things that people talk about are the method of loci and, the, and a priming technique. An idea of basically uh, method of loci, if you're trying to remember usually simple uh, information, you can imagine a house, imagine a location that you know very, very well, and then place objects in that house that will prime you to think about the thing that you need to remember. Um, imagine that if you needed to uh, remember mental imagery, a painting of a brain is sitting on your childhood uh, home's wall, but then you needed to remember um, that that mental imagery is reliant on memory. So you see a small statue of a hippo uh, next to the painting, and that's supposed to be your hippocampus and consolidation. And I just made that up off the top of my head, but um, a lot of memeticists use this idea of the method of loci, basically to build memory palaces that they can store information in for a brief amount of time and basically be able to recall things like 
all the cards in a random deck of cards. Um, there's also something called the priming technique, or uh, otherwise known as uh, pegword technique. The idea that um, we can use prime words that are concrete things that exist in the world um, to associate them with more abstract terms. The idea of time being associated with watch, uh, the idea of stability being associated with strong things like concrete or building blocks. Um, is a really salient technique that's used in a lot of different graphics, actually, every day. Um, we communicate uh, using these sorts of memory techniques with the goal of basically priming people to think about things. All right, so that's it for uh, mental imagery. Um, I'd love to go even more in detail, um, but unfortunately we're getting at a good steady clip, um, so we're going to go to the next chapter. Um, which we'll be talking about language, and language is going to be a blast. And I hope uh, that everyone has a very safe and pleasant weekend. The quiz has been posted, um, and everything is due on this coming Monday. So I hope you have a great weekend, and have a good day.